They, they should, they're supposed to be grateful that they can never, uh, for a moment, uh, not be afforded this wonderful protection. Uh, the father who will never go away. Um, the father who will never quit caring for them. Um, it's ironic, I think, that this should be the case in, in Iran, and I think that those who proposed the idea and kept it going for the last two decades failed to notice something exactly to do with paternity. <clears throat> the Iranian people lost, we think, at least a million, maybe a million and a half young people in the terrifying war that they waged with Saddam Hussein. Um, in order to make up the numbers, after this very depleting war, the Ayatollahs promised Iranian mothers very large subsidies if they would breed more children, which they did. Um, if you had a large family, four or five, you would get a, a great deal of state subsidy. The, the consequence is what I call a, a baby boomerang. There are now, we think, probably more than 50% of the Iranian population is under 25. And it's rather outgrowing the tutelage of parenthood. Um, and so the mullahs have, by accident, by unintended consequence, brought about a generation that doesn't like them. In particular, in particular uh, among the females. So that the moment is coming, I think it may already in fact have come, when the velayat faqi will no longer work. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, the, the, the appearance of an open society uh, not an open society, but a, a relatively open one com when compared with Saddam's Iraq or North Korea. Uh, but where all is allowed, but all is guided, and all is finally decided by a guardian council, um, has reached the point that Lenin described, <coughs> excuse me, the, the point that Lenin used to describe as a revolutionary situation, viz. a situation where the old order cannot continue in the old way, is unable to do so, and where those whom it rules do not wish, have no further desire to be ruled in the old way. So the crisis of totalitarianism with which I began um, is now where I'll stop because I've just got the relevant signal. Uh, and to say that there is, and we, we must hope that this is a constant finding. Uh, we, we may be flattering ourselves as mammals and primates, um, but it could be that there is something incompatible between us and our needs and our desires and our nature and the idea of a human system uh, that can uh, guarantee everything, uh, that can control everything, uh, that can know everything, um, and that can control and know and run everybody. And on that hope, we must uh, repose our own hopes. So thank you for being my prisoners, and I look forward to being your hostage in the next uh, half. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Christopher Hitchens. Uh, good evening. My name is Stephen Saum, and I'm the managing editor of Santa Clara Magazine. And I have the privilege of moderating your questions tonight, of which there are many, many, many. Um, and I, many of them having to do uh, right with where you left off, Christopher. Uh, are you hopeful about what's happening in Iran right now? Yes. Um, I, I have a lot of uh, contact with Iran through former students of mine, <clears throat> friends of mine, uh, through the email system. Um, there was a wonderful photograph this week of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards going house to house in Tehran and, and piling up satellite dishes, which they'd smashed, in the back of their trucks. Lots of luck to them. <laughs> it's too late. In Iraq, under Saddam Hussein, it was death to possess a satellite dish, and people didn't. It was too risky. For a while, it was death to possess a typewriter <coughs> because it meant you could type out something twice and pass it on. It worked, in fact. Iran is too big. Um, Tehran is too big. It's filled with, swollen with immigrants who are fleeing the, the countryside. Large illegal population, huge subversive student population. I'm, I'm delighted to see they keep on trying to smash the satellite dishes. It won't work. I, I hardly know any Iranian who doesn't have, because of the 
exile, the diaspora, at least one relative overseas. Most people know how to make an international phone call, even when they try and block the cell phones. Um, the stupider the regime, the more intelligent the people get, and the more humorous. <laughs> We're going to live to see great things in Iran. And in the meantime, for me, you know, the most wonderful thing is this. They've raised a generation of people who've completely seen through religion. They've got, they've got no more use for these verminous rulers at all. It's a wonderful thing to see. So I, a number of questions ask, what do you think U.S. policies should be toward Iran and uh, in conjunction toward, toward North Korea? Some folks, of course, worrying about an Obama administration uh, that would um, be more likely to fall uh, victim to appeasement. Well, the problem is this. There are two, tr uh, not tracks, there are two clocks ticking in Iran. One is the democracy movement clock, which is ticking now faster than it was, but it's got a lot of catching up to do. And the regime, remember, still has the monopoly of violence. And the Basiji and the goons who they employ may only be f uh, represent 5 to 10 percent of the population. I'm sure not more, but they do have a lot of force at their disposal, and they're very ruthless. Um, and then there's the clock that's ticking towards a nuclear weaponry, towards where these same goons will have nukes. Unless everyone here is very, very much unlike me or very much younger, they'll have had the fear in their life that one day a madman or a mad regime will get hold of a nuclear weapon. Well, you're about to find out what that feels like. And now that's where we can say that's not their internal affair. Iran has sworn repeatedly before every international body, the European Union, the UN, the International Atomic Energy Authority, it doesn't seek nuclear weapons, but it's lied. It's been caught lying. It's developing them very fast. It's going to use them for nuclear blackmail, not against Israel, in my opinion, but against neighboring Gulf Sunni states like Bahrain, which it will claim as its Kuwait. And then it will say, we walk into your country, what are you going to do? What's the West going to do? What's the UN going to do now they know we've got nukes? I was in Sorry if I bang on about this, but I think it's very important. I was in Beirut the other day. I got into a punch-up with the Hezbollah, the Iranian client um, in the region. The Hezbollah, at their, their election rallies, they lost very badly in Lebanon, by the way, I was pleased to see, as I think they did in Iran, by the way, if the truth were known. <clears throat> but you couldn't help noticing at the election rally that the Hezbollah symbol now is a nuclear mushroom cloud. That's the party symbol with some... Islamic words written underneath that uh, I hardly need to translate to you. Now remember, the Iranian regime still says it doesn't seek nuclear weapons. That's its official public position, but they forgot to tell Hezbollah that was the, that's the line. <laughs> and indeed, when Mahmoud Ahmadinejad um, the other day presided over the launching of some missiles that they were testing, he said, by the way, this also vindicates our nuclear program, again forgetting in public, as president, you're not supposed to admit that. Um, they've solemnly sworn they, they don't. So among, among the crimes that would be committed if they were allowed to get nuclear weapons is no international law of any kind or any resolution of any international body would be worth a dime if they could tear it up that easily and just laugh at us. So the question is one for, not for me, but for everyone, or for the president, but for everyone in this room. Which do you think is worse? that the mullahs get a bomb after the way they've behaved to their own people and to their neighboring countries and the way they intend to go on doing so, or that they be told that they can't have a bomb and that we'd accept the logical and probable consequences in either case. You don't have to answer now, but you do have to ask yourself. There's a question here that asks if, if you were to wear a, a button defining your politics, what would it be? <laughs> And I, and I should note, you are, in fact, wearing something on your lapel this evening. Our, our radio listeners can't see that. So maybe ah, th this is the flag of the uh, largest uh, people in the world who don't have a state of their own, the, the Kurds. There are 40 million Kurds, we think, in, in Iran, Iraq, Turkey, Syria, some in Lebanon. Also. It's the largest national ethnic group that doesn't have a state. Uh, the, the Kuwaiti royal family has its own vote at the United Nations. The Kurds, uh, with 40 million, don't have any representation at all. So I wear it in solidarity with them and in solidarity with the, the autonomy that they've managed to build in um, liberated uh, northern Iraq. 
Now you 